Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on pluralistic reasoning and machine learning. We start with a new topic today, sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, which are two very important tools in machine learning, but they are also interesting by themselves. Okay, so what have we seen so far? We've seen many basics, right? We talked a lot about probabilities and Bayesian networks, which might already be part of machine learning or not, depending on your perspective. And again, foundations, continuous probabilities, Gaussian distributions, estimators, and all these things. So the reason why I taught you all these things is because if you really want to have a deep understanding of machine learning, you have to know these basics, okay? So you have to learn them. And maybe you had some courses, but typically machine learning researchers, they have like a special, sometimes maybe superficial style to use these things. And so that's why I integrated it here. We also talked about linear regression, which is a topic from statistics, but it is also the basic of deep learning. So it's a very important topic. And it's, in, it's, it's nice that there, there's a lot of theory worked out already from other people that we as computer scientists can, can just use, okay? And that's, that's quite useful. However, there's a slightly different taste to it. So in mathematics or in statistics, people like to prove things. They like convergence proof and these kind of stuff. If they have it, that's great, right? So that's good for us when we write programs with it. However, if we don't have it, like in deep learning, where we stack lots of linear regressions on top of each other, we can just try it and we see whether we solve problems. And when we solve the problem, even without a proof, that's okay for us, right? And maybe in 10 years, someone else will prove that everything is fine. But so there's a slightly different attitude. Nonetheless, um, also in computer science, we like to prove things if we can, right? But Sometimes our capabilities are limited. All the questions are too difficult. If you have a deep neural network with many layers, maybe with a transformer layer or whatever, yeah, it's very difficult really to say something mathematical about it. So that's just very, very difficult. However, we can run experiments with it, which is the beginning. We also looked at the support vector machine, which is like a typical classification method, which is super popular. And along the way, you also learn something about optimization. So it's a useful topic to have. And then we looked at a couple of unsupervised learning methods, PCA, ISOMAP, and so on and so forth. Finally, we did look at deep learning a little bit about causality. And the last topic was Gaussian processes. Now, for the remainder of the semester, we will talk about sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And we just see them as tools that we have in our toolbox. But they are algorithms. So they are interesting for us as computer scientists by themselves because they are interesting, algor in interesting algorithms that work very well for particular questions. And sometimes we can also abstract from them and learn from them and maybe copy a trick from them for some other application. Finally, there will be a topic called statistical learning theory. So that's very mathematical and it's very theoretical. And I put it to the very end. There won't be an exercise about it. So there may, might be a yes, no question or something in the exam about it, but uh, we don't do calculations really with that one. Okay, so far so good. Let's start with sampling or sampling. And here we follow the book from David Mackay. Um, let me just jump to the link for the book. So where is the link for the book? So it's this book. Let me click on it. There's a website on it. Um, David Mackay unfortunately passed away already, way too early because of some nasty cancer. But he left a very big impact, not only in machine learning, with a nice book on information theory, inference, and learning algorithms. So that's a very Bayesian perspective on the whole topic. And it's very nicely written, very didactically made. All figures um, come with code, so you can reproduce everything that he has in his book. Everything is open source. You can download the PDF for free. You can also watch 16 lectures by himself giving on top of, on, about this book. But he also did um, some work afterward on sustainable energy, where he basically did some back of the envelope calculations for many things. So that's another recommended book that has nothing to do with machine learning, but it's, it's quite nice as well. Anyway, so this is a great book. And um, so he also has a good sense of humor. So he also compared it with Harry Potter. So have a look how they compare, which one you prefer, okay? Just go to the website and it's linked somewhere in the slide. So that's David Mackay and his wonderful book. And I also follow his book. And if there are certain topics, and I don't understand them, I look into his book, whether he has written something on it, because he explains the stuff very well and very original as well. 
So here's the definition from David Mackay, or let, let's say it's just a quote. So Monte Carlo methods are computational techniques that make use of random numbers. Okay, so that's Monte Carlo. Why is it called Monte Carlo? Because in Monte Carlo there's a big casino. Okay, and casinos are famous for generating random numbers, right? So in roulette, you have a sequence of random numbers. In blackjack, in principle, you have a sequence of random permutations, maybe, if you shuffle cards, and so on and so forth. So that's why they're called Monte Carlo methods. And um, let's see what you can do with Monte Carlo methods. So we are trying to solve two problems, where when we solve the first problem, it helps us with the second. So we somehow want to generate samples from a given PDF where the PDF now is given in functional form. It might not even be normalized, so it might be just a function that is always positive, but that might not be integrated to one. But it gives us basically the rule what are the most likely values of x and which are not. So from practical programming, you might think, though, this is so trivial, right? So we just call rand or rand n, right? And that's it. However, rand, might be easy to implement or somewhat easy to implement. Rand n, we will see, it's a little bit sophisticated. Yeah, we will use some transformation trick and we see today how to implement Rand n. Um, but all the others are much harder to sample from. So it's not trivial. So there's a book from, here's another book which I didn't link from Luc Devois. It's called Random Numbers, I think. It's a big Springer book, a yellow one. And it's a big book only about how to sample numbers. Okay, so it's really a big topic. It's far from trivial. So why sample from a PDF? Yes, as we've seen last time in GPs, it's nice to sample example functions for GPs to show it some practitioner and to say, are those, is this a reasonable prior? Is it useful or not? But it's also useful to calculate certain integrals, okay? So here's an integral. So where basically we are integrating with some density, yeah? So the density is giving us some weighting of the different x. And actually we are interested in the integral of some function phi of x, which could be positive and negative. So it could be anything. So of course, this integral can be written in probabilistic terms also as the expected value of this function phi of x, okay? Where I'm now writing a capital X here to denote x is a random variable, yeah? So, or even shorter, the expectation of phi of x. That's what we want to calculate. So often those are expectations, and expectations are like summaries of distributions. Yeah? We would like to get the mean, the variance can be also expressed as an expectation, so it's something super useful. But sometimes you are just interested in a complicated integration that has no probabilistic interpretation. However, if you can tweak your integral in such a way that you get some px dx at the end, so if there is something where you know it integrates to 1 at the end, then you can use these Monte Carlo methods to numerically estimate that integral. Okay, so it's a very general method. So now, how does it work? The idea is very simple. So we just replace this integration by a finite summation. So we sample data points xi from this distribution p of x, and then we evaluate phi of x at these random locations, and we calculate the mean of that one. Yeah? The empirical mean has a finite sum. The expectation, or the, the mean overall, has an integration, and again, this is a German sign for S. Yeah, I don't know which mathematician introduced that one, but that's the German S. S is the sigma, that's the Greek S. And both stand for sum, so both are sums. But this is typically a continuous sum, and this is a discrete sum. So continuous sums are nice for pencil and paper calculations, right? And we sometimes do that. Finite sums, yeah, discrete sums, they are nice for computer scientists because that's a for loop, right? That can be just implemented in a computer, and we can get after a finite amount of time something useful. So Monte Carlo method gives us this nice link from something continuous, mathy, from sheets of papers into a computer, how to calculate it. And I think if you look at the history of Monte Carlo methods, I think they were, I think, I'm not sure, but part of them, they were invented at the Los Alamos project where they were trying to invent the atomic bomb and they needed to calculate some complicated stuff. And then they came up with some finite approximations, how they could use computers, basically, with finite sums, how they could approximate it. Yeah? But um, this, quote, this, this note should just make you curious and look it up yourself, so I might be partially wrong, okay? But there's an interesting history of these methods. So let's look at an example already. So let's try to calculate the expectation of the maximum of two Gaussian distributed numbers. Yeah? 
So what do I mean? So let's say I have two random variables, x and y. They're independently standard normally distributed with the Gaussian distribution. What is the mean of the maximum of those two? Yeah, first of all, note, since x and y, again, I'm using capital letters, are random variables, since I'm having an expression with random variables, the new expression is also a random variable, right? So I could define a, a variable capital Z, which is the maximum of those two. And so it makes sense to ask for the distribution of that one, right? Since this is a transformation of two numbers into one, so it will also have a density, and I can calculate also the expectation. However, we can also just rewrite the expectation now with these double integrals. So we integrate out the x and the y, and then we apply twice our Monte Carlo trick. So we can plug in for the inner integration the finite sum. And again, the key here is now we can omit the p of x, right? Where did it go? It goes basically into the um, frequency with which we see the xi, right? So if there are one xi which is very frequent, by randomly sampling from p of x, we will see the xi more frequent. And if there's a very rare xi, yeah, because p of x might be very small, we see it less frequent. Okay? And then just by summing up, taking the empirical average of these values, we get a valid estimate where basically the values of the most likely xi yeah, gets a much larger weight. Okay, we have another integral. Let's get rid of that one too. And then we have basically a double summation like this. And now we can generate a sample x1 to xm for the x and y1 to yn for the y. And now there are also variations, right? I could also say, ah, oh, let's be double safe. Let's take, generate the sample for the xi. But then for every xi, we generate the sample y1 to ym. So every time in every step of our for loop here, we generate a new sample. OK, you can do it, fine. If you have enough time, you can do it. But it's also OK just to take these. There's even another way to do it. We could also directly sample pairs. So we could sample pairs from the joint distribution, yeah, which is just the, the multivariate Gaussian distribution with a circular covariance matrix. So we just take these pairs, and then we calculate for each pair the maximum and sum everything up. And for n against infinity, we will be fine. Everything will be OK. And we converge against the right value. Um, let me see whether I have code for that one already. Uh, whether I omitted that one. Oh, yeah, I have it. So here's some code. Um, basically, that is the math that we've just seen. And um, so now the implementation of this summation really gets really simple. Oh, there's something missing. So here must be some um, normalization. So that one was missing. OK, now it's 1 divided by n, and then the, the summation of all these values. And the code gets really trivial. So I randomly sample a 2 by n matrix. Yeah? So I have one row for x and one row for y. And then I'm taking the maximum along the first axis, which is exactly first entry against the second entry. And I get a vector of z. And of that one, I'm just calculating the mean. And I'm getting some number. And of course, as you see, it's a Monte Carlo estimate. So it's always slightly different. Yeah? So in a way, this z mean is also a random sample of the distribution of z's, yeah, if I would have the true distribution. But if I make this larger and larger, yeah, the number should get more and more constant. Yeah? If I make it smaller, of course, um, then it's varying much more. But it's kind of, it makes sense that it's, it's coming from the same distribution and that there is some, some reasonable mean. Um, just for fun, I plotted here the histogram of this z, right? To show you, it is not a Gaussian distribution. It looks a bit asymmetrical here. So I don't know how many points did we. So let's take 100,000 data points and let's plot it into 20 bins. Then we get something like that. Let's take 50 bins. So you see, you get something that looks maybe it is symmetric. No, I doubt it that it's symmetric. Oh, but I'm not sure. Could it be Gaussian? OK, that's something for you to look up. What is the distribution of the maximum of two randomly Gaussian distributed variables? So it looks quite symmetric. Yeah. But at least it doesn't have mean 0. Yeah? The, the mean is slightly positive, which makes sense. There might be pairs where both numbers are negative. So sometimes I'm getting a negative maximum. But most of the time, at least one of them is positive, And so I'm kind of shifted towards the positive numbers. OK? And of course, you could also do the same thing now with more than, more than 
2. So let's do it for 10, okay? So the code says x, y is equal, but okay, now we have x, y, z, and so on and so forth. So let's see what we get then. And it's increasing, so the mean is larger, right? Which makes sense. If the, if the mean is, um, if, if I have more points to take the minimum, uh, the maximum, then of course the value will also increase, okay? So that is a thing which is not so easy, I guess, to derive the distribution of the maximum. It's a bit tricky, but by running a simulation, we can very easily calculate it. Yeah? So now this is just very short, very short code, and we can calculate something very complicated. So far, so good. Everyone's happy with that one. Let's now talk about some properties. So it's an estimator, first of all. So what does it mean, estimator, again? An estimator is something where you plug in observed data. Yeah? So for example, um, here in this summation, I need to sample now 100 samples from my distribution p of x, and then I plug it into it. And so I could also write it as a function phi hat, and for estimators in statistics, people often put a hat on top of the variable they'd like to estimate. So this is the estimator phi hat, and it has this input, x1 to xn, and it's defined to be this average. Now I just gave it a name, and that is the so-called Monte Carlo estimator. And we can talk about the properties. So the first property is the MC estimator is unbiased, where unbiased means, I think in German it's erwartungstreu, so that's maybe something that you've heard before. In English it's unbiased. It basically means the mean of it is the true mean. Okay, so what's that supposed to mean? It means if I take the, if I plug in random variables here, yeah, where x1 is coming from p and xn is also coming from the same distribution, but those are the n random variables that generate a sample. So I could, if I sample from x1 to xn, it's like doing the experiment today with 100 samples and doing the experiment tomorrow with another 100 samples and the day after tomorrow or in a parallel universe or whatever, okay? And for each of these, um, ex each of the samples that I, each of these numbers that I get, I can calculate this phi hat. So the phi hat is always a formula that you typically can calculate. However, since I now plugged in random variables into my estimator, the whole thing becomes a random variable, and so it also has a distribution. So it makes sense to ask for the expectation of that one. And as it turns out, it will be the expectation of phi of x. Yeah, where I omitted all these things, x is of course also distributed according to my distribution p. Yeah, so basically it means, on average, I'm really getting the mean that I'm interested in. So flipping back to the previous slide with the maximum, so I'm interested here in the actual expectation of this maximum, and it means that the mean of this expression, if I plug in random variables and then take the expectation of that one, will be the mean that I want to calculate. Yeah? So somehow this garbage here must disappear somehow. Yeah? So let's see why is that the case. Ah, before that, Ah, let me first show you why that's the case. So, I want to prove now that e of e hat is equal to uh, phi of e, uh, now e of phi hat is equal to phi. And um, let's do that on the board maybe. It's, it's really not super difficult. First of all, um, what is this phi hat now? That is a shortcut for phi hat applied to x1 to xn, okay? And then what is this phi? It has exactly the same letter. That is basically the function phi applied to capital X. And then the expectation. So it's the expecta expected value of this function phi applied to X. Okay? Um, so let's see what is the expectation of phi hat. Okay, it's the expectation of phi hat apply to all these random variables. Let's plug in our expression for that. It's the expectation of 1 divided by n summation. Phi apply to each of those. And now expectation is a linear operator, so I can drag it in. Now the xi, they are all distributed the same. They are all distributed according to my p, maybe p sub x, 
and the x as well, okay? So I can replace this expectation with the expectation phi of x, great. So here is no i anymore. I have the summation over something that is constant with i. And how long is the summation? It goes from 1 to n. So it will be n times z, which is 1 by 1 divided by n. And then I have another expression for that one, which is just phi. OK? So the shortcut notation is basically unbiasedness means this. OK? So that is very shortcut. But there's something behind it. OK, so far so simple. So that is this derivation on your slides as well. Let's see what the other property is. We can also say something about the variance, OK? So the variance of our MC estimator decreases linearly in n, OK? Nice. So what does it written out means? The variance of this random variable phi hat, OK, is equal to 1 divided by n, the variance of our random variable. That is a very nice property. Let me show you why. So maybe I should reshuffle my slides. So it means if I have more and more data, so the larger my sample is, the variance will go to 0. Okay? That is what we also experience in our notebook, right? When I increase the sample, somehow it wasn't as wiggly anymore. So it was like 0 0.56 or something, and only in the digits behind that there was some variation. So that is a very nice property to have. And of course, it can be also proven. Yeah. And let's see, do we want to see it now? Yeah, why not? Let's see it. Um, OK, let me try to prove it on the board. And as a backup, I have a slide on that one. <coughs> OK, so let me first copy variance of phi hat. OK, now we are already familiar with the notation. Let's keep it just like that. And um, I don't know, did I switch off to the other screen for the other derivation? Oh, well, OK, good, that's good. So let's plug everything in. First of all, note the variance of a random variable. What is it? It's the expectation of another random variable, right? It's the expectation of this random variable. And this random variable is the distance of x and its mean. So what is random in this part? In this part, only the x is random from the perspective of the outer e. And this thing is just a real number, right? So this is just a real number. OK, let's use it formula. So we get expectation of phi hat minus its mean. And we know its mean. It's unbiased estimator, so it's minus phi and then squared. So let's resolve it. So it's the expectation of phi hat squared minus 2 times phi times phi hat. OK, so that's the mixed term plus phi squared. OK, so far so good. So the expectation can be applied to each of these. So let's see what we get. So we get the expectation of phi hat squared. I think that's the most interesting term. Then we have the expectation of minus 2 phi and phi hat. The phi is already a real number, right? So the only random bit is this one. So we can drag it out. So it's 2 times phi times the expectation of phi hat. So far, so good. And then we have an plus the expectation of phi squared. But that is a real number. There's nothing random anymore. So it's just phi squared. So far, so good. So let's go on. Let's first deal with the simple stuff. So here we know this is equal to phi, right? So we have minus 2 phi squared plus phi squared. So it's the same as saying we're having here minus phi squared, right? And the brackets are like this. OK, so far, so good. So let's now, we did already part of the work without plug it into the estimator. Let's plug in the estimator. So it's the thing squared. So let's do that carefully. So it will be 
um, 1 over n summation over the xi's. So this one times 1 over n summation over xi's. OK, so far so good. Minus, and then bracket close, minus phi squared. OK, so if you multiply two sums, everyone gets multiplied with everyone else. OK, so that is like having a big matrix. We have x1 to xn, and then x1 to xn. And every entry in this matrix here is one of the summons of the resulting sum. So you get a double sum over the first index, let's call it i, and the second index, let's call it j. OK? So it's a sum with n squared elements. Let's split it into the ones that are along the diagonal and into the ones that are not along the diagonal, OK? So we get, or maybe let's write it out once, and then we do the split. So it's 1 divided by n squared, because I multiply these two terms. And then I'm having this double summation of i and j being equal to 1 to n of xi and xj minus phi squared. OK, so far so good. Um, next. Now let's do this thing that we split. Let's take the, the ones where i is equal to j into one part. So we have the expectation of 1 divided by n squared of the summation i equals 1 to n xi squared. OK, so those are the terms on the diagonal. Fine. And then we have another sum, 1 over n. Oh, there's an n squared, and this must be an n squared. Um, of the terms that are different. So let's write it i, j to n, where i is not equal to j. OK. Let's put some brackets, minus phi squared. So let's first think about the first term here. I can again drag in the e into the summation. And then I have the expectation of these xi squared. And that is the same as the expectation of the x squared, which is the same distribution. OK? So basically, each summand here is, does not depend on i. So that means that um, the first one, I get 1 over n squared times n times expectation of x squared. OK? And now I did a mistake already. I guess this must be phi of xi, and that must be phi of xj. And similarly here, phi of xi and phi of xj. Let's repair it, phi. OK, now it's repaired, which basically means here now expectation of phi of xi, x, xi is expectation of phi of x squared. So like this, OK? So now we are fine again. And these x's are all capital in here. I, I hope on the slide it's all, all correct. So, so that means this is the expectation of this guy squared. Like that one, so that is the first as the first sum. And now we have these mixed terms, and for that one we take the following rule. If I'm having two random variables, x and y, and they are independent of each other, which means basically that your joint distribution is factorizing, then it's easy to see that the expectation of x and y is equal to the expectation of x times the expectation of y. OK? And that can be easily proven by writing this as an integral, plugging in the joint, using the property, and then reshuffling the terms, and then you have this one. OK? So which we have here now, xi and xj, they have the same distribution, but they are independently sampled. OK? So I can drag the expectation on each of the terms. So I have the 1 over n squared. And then I'm having a couple of terms here. Summation over ij, i not equal to j. 
expectation of xi, expectation of xj. And now with the same reasoning, OK, I can omit the i. And I can also omit the j. Because the expectation of xn is the same as the expectation of x. OK, so far so good. Now I just need to count how many of those do I have. Or maybe I should, um, and those are, this is basically, by the way, equal to phi squared. Yeah. So now I need to count, so how many off diagonal entries do I have? Yeah, so how large is the summation? There's one missing here. So let's rewrite this. So this is the expectation. 1 over n times the expectation of phi of x, and the square is outside. OK. Hopefully, at the end, it's correct. And now I need to count the, the terms. They are all the same in this summation there. So how many do I have? So here I'm having n square terms. Yeah. And if I remove the diagonal, I'm having n squared minus n terms. OK, so that's my formula. So I'm having um, n squared minus n times the phi squared. Then there's another one. That is a minus phi squared. And I extend that one with n squared divided by n squared. And then you see, OK, interesting. So I can drag out the 1 divided by n squared. And then I'm having n squared, phi squared, n squared, phi squared, and they disappear. And the only thing that remains is this minus n times phi squared. So I'm getting 1 over n expectation of phi of x squared. And then I'm having a 1 over n minus 1 over n and uh, let me check. So it's just this middle term here. OK, so far so good. Um, let's see. Next step, let me replace that one again with the expectation of phi of x. Let's drag out the 1 over n. Let's drag out the expectation. OK, we get 1 over n expectation of this one minus z1, and there's a square missing squared. And that is just the formula for the variance. So we get 1 over n variance of phi of x. Question? Ah, OK, there's something, there's another formula missing. OK, let me show you the last trick formula that I used. Thanks for asking. So the variance of a random variable x is expectation of the square distance, right? But this can be rewritten as the expectation x squared minus the expectation of x squared. OK, so that is something that can be easily derived, which we would need now. If we don't have that one, uh, we would have to go on a little bit. Yeah? OK, what have we shown? We've shown that this estimator here, the variance of the estimator, is depends, of course, on the variance of this random variable here. So if that one is very large, of phi of x, then, of course, our estimator will also have a large variance. However, the variance goes arbitrarily small with increasing n. OK? So far, so good. If you couldn't follow, here's the whole calculation, hopefully without typos. If there are typos, please let me know. So that's basically the same thing that I showed you on the board. Yeah? And trust me, I could only write it out like this because I looked at the slide for 10 minutes before the lecture. Otherwise, I also couldn't do this. Because there are so many things to write it more complicated, and so this is already quite condensed. But maybe there's even a shorter version. OK, so that's a great property, because it tells us that our estimator works. So this is like classical statistics style. Now we've shown it's unbiased, which is a nice property, and it's converging against the right one. Question? Uh, 
in here, here, here. Ah, oh, you're right, you're right. So there's still a mistake. Okay, so I can't drag out. The good thing is I don't have to drag it out. So it must be like that. You're right, there was something missing. Um, so for everyone on the TV screens, so it was this one, there's something, there was an E missing. Now it's fine? Hopefully. I think I did it right on the, on the slides here. Yeah, so here I'm, I'm plugging in for the phi, I'm plugging in the expectation E of phi. And it's inside the squared. And then I can use this formula here. Let's see. Okay, and for your, um, so if you want to look it up, it's also here the formula. Okay, so we've seen this simple Monte Carlo estimator, so that's, that's nice. So the question is, how do we get samples now? That's the next task. Right, so we have an estimator to um, approximate integ integrals, but I haven't told you really how to sample from a density. And so that's what we're doing next, okay? And sometimes it's easy, sometimes sampling is easy. So here's a very simple problem which we can solve with uniform samples, okay? And that is getting an estimate for pi, yeah? So that's a fun problem. I don't know whether you know it already, so the, the basic idea is um, we draw a square here yeah, on the board, and inside of the square we draw a circle. Then you know if the side length of the square is 2, yeah, then the area of the whole thing is 4, okay, and the area of the circle is pi. Yeah. So that means um, we know that if you now throw darts, yeah, you can all now throw darts to the board. I go to the side, and then we count how many darts hit the square and how many darts hit the circle, okay? And then we know that the number of darts that hit the circle divided by the number of darts that hit the square, yeah, so the whole area here, yeah, that will be equal to pi divided by 4. Okay, question? Oh, I forgot to switch. Okay, so here's a nice example with the dart. So here's our square and the circle, and you can throw darts. And then the area of the circle, or the number of darts that hit the circle is this number of circle, and then the ones that go into the square is that one, and we know the ratio is pi quarter. Okay, so far so good. Now we just need to throw darts, but throwing darts means I'm uniformly sampling, right? And let's say I'm, I'm uniformly sampling that one. It will look like this somehow. And uniformly means it looks right. And now we could also count, right? So I think those are 20 of those, and about 17 are inside the circle. And then the quotient 17 divided by 20 is a good approximation for pi quarter. Okay, so that's the algorithm. And mathematically writing it down, we do it slightly different. Let's take the quarter circle, okay? The quarter circle is just um, the area up here. Why am I, do I like that one? Because if I sample uniformly with rand in a computer, it's typically between zero and one. And then I also sample uniformly from zero to one on the y-axis, and that gives me a random sample here. And now I just need to calculate the distance of a sample to the origin and ask whether it's smaller than one or not. And then I count it. So we write the uniform density again with these Iverson brackets, which are one if it's true inside or zero otherwise. And the basic idea is throwing darts. Mathematically, we sample x1, the first coordinate from a uniform distribution, x2. And then pi will be four times the um, number of times that I'm basically inside the circle, okay? And I think it must be four times, be yeah, we can try it. We look at the code. We worry about the constants when we play around with the code, okay? Then we see whether it's right or wrong. So it's just the expectation of some weird random variable where the random variable is an Iverson bracket, yeah, that just evaluates to one and zero. We can just implement it very simple. Um, 
And it can be also seen like an integral against these uniform distributions, and that's like an approximation for pi. Um, now, in order to s estimate that by sampling, we rewrite our integration now by samples, okay? So we write it by a finite summation. So let's look at the code. So here's my code, so that should be the right math. Um, I'm randomly sampling again pairs of uniformly distributed, so this is rand and not rand n. And then I'm having here some, some number, which is it's a, that's basically the result of the Iverson bracket. So I'm asking a question whether the norm of my data points is less than one. And out comes a NumPy array that is Boolean with, the, with truths and false values. But then when I multiply true with 1.0, I get a 1. And if I multiply false with 1.0, I get a 0. Okay? So that gives me numbers. I can calculate the mean. And that is my estimate of pi hat. And of course, I can also make a scatter plot of everyone who's inside. And ideally, this pi hat is a good approximation. And it is. Okay? So that's an approximation of pi. Again, we could increase the number of data points. And it gets better and better. Yeah? And this is a trade-off, of course, right? So the method is super simple. Yeah? It's really trivial to do. There's, there's not much higher mass in here. And um, however, it might be very wasteful with the samples, and it might be very slow. So there are much faster methods to calculate pi, which are um, defined with some series where you can write books on, yeah? some divergent series or some conversion series. And that are basically tuned that they converge as fast as possibly possible. So there are these, um, I think you can have some Taylor expansions of some sinus of something. And then that's also other methods to get like an expansion of pi. And some of them are converging super fast. So that is not super fast. Yeah, I think you can have already after, so this is a for loop with 100,000 steps, but you can have already a better approximation probably with a for loop of five steps if you use the right formula. Okay. However, the right formula might cost you um, 20 years of your lifetime to develop. Okay, So this is the quick and dirty method. And that's in general true for sampling. Sampling is a quick and dirty method, which gives you quickly results, yeah, computationally at least, if you have computational power. But there might be much better methods to do. So if you have a better method, you should use always a better method. Like sampling is more like a last resort of to do things. OK, so far so good. We can also look at the following here, and that is showing me how good is the estimate after seeing 200 data points. How good is my estimate after seeing 400 data points? And so here you see a nice curve how we are approaching the orange line, which is exactly pi. OK? And you can play around here with the code to see how this goes, right? So it should, I'm not sure what am I getting now. Or maybe, OK, so at the beginning it's very bad, and then it's very good. OK, nice. So can we do this, let's say, minus 100? And then I can say, oh no, I don't need to do that one. I need to, let's, let's ignore the first 100 data points. Is that right? Oh, I'm not sure whether that works. Uh, OK, whatever. I'm, ah, no, no, I'm doing something wrong here. I guess I need to say here minus 99, maybe. Yeah, 99 was the right guess. No, but OK, it looks like. Taking so many data points um, cannot be plotted reasonably here. So maybe I, I should do the a logarithmic plot. What is it? Do you know? What the, is it semi-log at y? Is that the right one? Oh, yeah, it is. OK, it's, it helps a little bit. But you see it's converging quite fast. And we know how fast it converges with 1 over n, OK, which is quite reasonable. OK, so far so good. So that was estimating pi, and here's some code. However, in general, sampling is much harder. So those are like nice toy examples where it's super easy and useful. Now let's sample from a PDF P of x, yeah, or maybe even an unnormalized PDF. Yeah? Sometimes we can write down a PDF, but we don't know the normalization constant. That appears, for example, for mark of random fields. So that's an area where you can easily write down P star of x, but you don't have P of x. So intuitively, what we could do, of course, we could discretize the range of x, right? And then we have a finite number of regions. And for each region, now, somehow, we need to estimate the local probability, for example, by calculating p of x plus delta minus p of something. So 
And then like Riemann integration, we could calculate the size of the column or something like that. So that's possible in principle. And then we could sample from a finite distribution. So that's possible in general. However, if we go into high dimensions, and of course in machine learning we like high dimensions, so that's where we want to have methods for, we need exponentially many regions. Okay, so Riemann integration in practically, we practically doing Riemann integration in 10 dimensions, that's already prohibitive. Okay. Similarly, the other problem is that some regions that are very important yeah, are hard to find. Okay, and for that, there's a nice analog analogy from David Mackay's book. And um, let me show you the analogy. analogy. So it's the so-called lake analogy. And the story is like this. We have some lake. So there's a little boat up here, and there's a lake. And the depth of the lake is the PDF. Okay, so that's some unnormalized function, which tells us how deep the water is at that location. And in a way, it's also really a density, right? Because if I would fill like a, a pipe of a particular shape and I fill it with water, then the density will tell me how, how, uh, what the weight of this water is if I go up to the ground. So when I'm interested in the average plankton concentration in the whole lake, yeah? So here's my, my random sampling goes like this. I drive around with my boat to n locations. Those are my sample points. So I have locations xi that are uniformly distributed, maybe, or across the whole lake. And I always measure the depth, p star of xi, and the plankton concentration, which is the phi of xi. And then I can use some nice formula and sum everything up. However, the problem here is that I never know whether I really reach these super deep regions or not. Yeah? So I cannot know that. If I would know that, then sampling would be much easier. But in general, my p of x or my p star of x could be so complicated that I just don't know where the minima are. An example for a complicated function where we don't know the minima is the loss function in deep learning. If we knew the minima already, we could go after one iteration right to the optimal value. But that's not possible. Yeah? That's why we have these gradient descent methods. And you can bet there are methods also in sampling that use gradient descent style tricks. Okay, So there is this something like that. So that is a nice analogy why sometimes it can be really hard. Yeah? And you really don't know where the, whether you get, got a good estimate or not. You just don't know it. Okay, you, you just need to continue. You know for n against infinity you will do the right thing, but you don't know how large n has to be. So that's really a hard problem. Um, Sometimes um, the PDF has some nice form, and we can write it on a piece of paper and calculate nice things, and then we can use the transformation of variable trick. And that is something I think where we will have an exercise to in the, next, in the current sheet. Maybe it is already handed out? Maybe not, I don't know. And of course, the transformation of variable trick is something that you can also vary in infinitely many forms, so it's a classical exam question. Yeah? So please practice that one. Please be sure that you understand that one. So what was this transformation of variable about? It was, suppose we are given some random variable for which we know the density, p sub x, and we have some invertible function f. And for me as a computer scientist, that is a computer program maybe. Yeah? And I'm transforming the samples from the p of x. Then I get new samples from y. And of course, the y will also have some density function. And this transformation of variables answers the question, what is this density function for y? And it can be computed from the one from x with some reasonable formula here. Where I don't like this form so much, that is the one that you see very often in textbooks. I like it to write this, I think it's Leibniz notation, that somehow, this is, you know it usually from integration, that kind of the the height of the density times the width of a little box. Think again of Riemann integration. Yeah? So these volume elements, they should stay the same. Yeah? So if I change my variable, go from one coordinate system into another one, yeah, then the little pieces, the little d-axis, and the volume of that one, and the volume in the other coordinate system, they should stay the same. Always other words, if I integrate against these ones, they should stay the same. Okay. And if you rewrite this, yeah, I can move the dy onto the other side by dividing by it, and then I have this formula that is written up here. The reason why it looks even more complicated is because 
the input on the left hand side is y, but my p sub x requires an x. So how do I get an x? I get it by applying the inverse of f to my y. Okay, so this will be again in the domain of x. Similarly here, I'm having the dx divided by dy, which is basically the derivative of the inverse function. Yeah? It's just a shortcut notation for that one. And then I have absolute values here. Why do I need the absolute values? Yes, because typically it doesn't matter whether I'm, um, trans let's say you are, your transformation is multiplying by 5, okay? then the derivative of it will be 1 fifth, of the inverse would be 1 fifth, so, and it doesn't matter whether I multiply by minus 5 or by plus 5, okay? So the sign is not important, only the magnitude of the derivative. Okay, so far so good. So that is our formula here. And now comes a most useful example. So first of all, um, if I have a random variable with some PDF, yeah, then we can also define the corresponding CDF, which is the cumulative distribution function, which is just the integral from minus infinity to x, and here I'm using a different name for the x. I'm using x tilde because that's the variable I'm integrating over. Okay? However, the x tilde, of course, has also the same distribution of the x. So maybe I should have put here a p sub x in here. So that is the cumulative dis <coughs> distribution function. <coughs> Excuse me. And I hope you're all familiar with that one. So the PDF of a Gaussian distribution looks like that. And the corresponding CDF looks like this. Yeah. It's a monotonically increasing function that is starting at 0 and then it goes until 1. And it's basically calculating the area under the curve, under the PDF. OK, so far so good. So here comes the deep insight. Now, suppose I have a random variable. Let's define another one by moving our random variable through the cumulative distribution function. Okay? So we get a random variable y. And now we can ask, so what is the distribution of y? And the funny thing is we can derive that the PDF is just a uniform distribution. And the result holds independent of my starting distribution. Of course, it should be real number distribution and blah, blah, blah. So the usual assumption here. But for any arbitrary distribution here, I will end up with a uniform distribution, which is quite surprising. Did I prove that already in this lecture? I don't think so. So visually, we can also view it like that. So let's say we have samples from this Gaussian distribution. So we have many in the middle and only a few back there. And then we can basically move all of them down here, maybe like this. OK, and if you do that and then move them to the side, you will get approximately equally spaced lines. OK, so here we will have a uniform distribution. Yeah, you start with samples from that one, you pass it through this nonlinearity, OK, and you get a uniform distributed random variable over here. OK, so here's nothing. It only goes up to here. Yeah, so that's very interesting. I mean, try it. Yeah? Take a, I think in, in NumPy and SciPy, you can get the PDF of some weird density. Uh, you get a weird density and the, the cumulative distribution function you can always, I think they are often also implemented as CDF. They are called CDF. And then you can just randomly sample from it and you pass it through the CDF. And you look at the histogram, and you, see, you, see, you should see a uniform distribution. Maybe I should include it in my talk, uh, in my slides in here. So here's the proof of that statement. So let's check out the proof. Um, I can also do it on the board. You prefer on the board? Maybe it's a bit slower. Yeah? OK. For that one, let me just erase it. Or let's take the second one. <coughs> So let me just copy the um, relevant formulas that I need. So I need this transformation formula, which is p sub y of little y is equal to um, p sub x of f inverse of y 
times. And now it says this dx dy. Let's keep it simple. Let's take f inverse and the derivative applied to y. Okay, so that is another way to write it up. And now I'm saying I'm having an x which is distributed according to p sub x. And then I'm having a y which is defined to be the CDF of y, so which was uh, of x. So which was capital F applied to the random variable x, right? So, and now first of all, so what is my f? Okay, so my f is this function here. So the f of little x is equal to this capital X of the capital, uh, capital F of the capital X of the little x, okay? So far, so good. Um, next, what is um, the inverse, the derivative of the inverse? So that's something interesting. So the derivative of the inverse, there's the so-called inverse function theorem, which you might have heard. Yeah? And the inverse function theorem says that it's 1 divided by, I think, the uh, f of the inverse value. So let me check. Let me check that. I don't want to write it down wrongly. So let me just write exactly the inverse function theorem. Where is it? Oh, down here. So it's f of blah, blah, blah. OK, fine. So I got it. So again, this one is this funny bit. So that is kind of getting into the right. So the f prime is work living in x space. So I need something from the x space. That's why I need to transport it back. But in principle, it reads like this, f inverse prime is equal to 1 divided by f prime. Yeah, And the, there's a graphical proof for that one. So if I have some function, let's say this one, yeah, then I can reflect everything with 1 divided by something. And I'm, I think I'm getting a picture like that. And then somehow you can, oh, that's not a good explanation here. Uh, OK, I don't like it. Ah, OK, so it is, a, it is an OK explanation. So this is x, that is y. So basically, this is f, and that is f inverse. So why is it reflecting on the axis? Because I'm flipping the roles of x and y. That's why this is the inverse function of that one. OK, and then for symmetrical reasons, so the derivative here will be 1 over the derivative on the mirror, on the mirrored function. That's approximately the inverse function theorem. OK, fine. So I hope you trust me on that one. So this is an expression from the inverse function theorem. However, now we also have an expression for the derivative of f, right? So what is the derivative of f? Anyone knows? So let's write it out. I think that I'm not sure whether it's one of the Satz der Integrale und Differentialrechnung or something, but it's one of the big theorems in analysis one that the derivative is exactly p of x. Yeah, that's just a theorem, one of the big theorems in analysis one. So we know that the inverse derivative of y is equal to one divided by p sub x of this one. OK, so far so good. Um, we haven't uh, yet used our transformation formula, but let's do that. <coughs> let's just continue here. So we have the first expression. Let's just keep it like it is. Times the second expression, which we derive to be 1 divided by this guy. And that is equal to 1. Now, the only thing where we have to be careful is, OK, so this is, of course, only defined for y from the interval from 0 to 1. 
okay? And the other values are not possible because my distribution function will always be in the interval 0 to 1. So the resulting density elsewhere will be 0. But on the interval 0 to 1, I'm constant 1. And that is exactly the uniform distribution. OK? So far, so good. OK, that is very nice because um, this lets us transform uniform into anything by doing it backwards. OK, so we've seen the forward way, the forward path in a way. So if we have some random variable that is distributed according to some p sub x, then y being the result of applying the CDF is uniform. So we are experts in uniform, right? We have these RAND implementations in our computer. So let's do it backwards. So if I'm starting with y being uniform distributed, I can apply the inverse function and get something that is distributed according to p sub x. OK, so I can start with RAND, and then I'm applying some weird nonlinear function, yeah? and I get samples that are coming from my distribution that I'm interested in. Yeah, where I don't have any assumption on my p sub x besides being on the real number and so on and so forth. So how can we now sample from the exponential distribution that has the following PDF? So the exponential distribution, maybe we've seen it not yet, but so it has this PDF, right? Fine. I can plot it for you. So it, it looks like, like this. So it's uh, lambda times x minus lambda x. So. First of all, it's only defined for positive x. It's not defined for negative x. OK. And then it's an e function. So the e function looks like that, as you all know. However, here we have the minus, e to the minus. So it will look something like this. And there's nothing on the negative side. And now we can could wonder, what, is, what about this number here? So e to the 0 is equal to 1 times lambda, OK? So this is equal to lambda. And now what about this minus lambda thing in here? That's just so that everything is normalized properly. So if you integrate lambda times e to the minus lambda x, or maybe let's just do it. Shall we do it? Yeah, let's, let's find the stamm function of that one. So that will be, I think, um, I'm not sure about your notation, but it's minus x e minus lambda x a, b, evaluated at a and b. Yeah, if you calculate the derivative of this one, it's the derivative of the inner function, which is minus lambda, which gives us a lambda. And then the derivative of the outer function, which is e to the something, the derivative is e to the something, so it gives us the e to the something. OK? So, and if you integrate this from minus infinity to plus infinity, or in this case from 0 to plus infinity, then basically um, this integral will be um, equal to lambda, uh, to 1 divided by lambda. Yeah, I think so. So if I plug in, is that right? OK, let's check that. So basically, now I'm, I'm saying integration from 0 to infinity of the same stuff that we've just seen before is minus x minus lambda x with the boundaries um, from 0 to infinity. If I plug in infinity, I'm getting 0. And if I'm plugging in the 0, I'm getting lambda. OK, so I'm a bit confused now with this, whether that is the right normalization factor. But am I doing something wrong? Hmm. I'm a bit confused. Actually, I want to have it should be equal to 1, right? Ah, OK. Ah, 
Oh, sorry. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. That saved my day. So, okay, so plugging in the zero for the x is the lambda is gone, and we just have e to the zero, which is equal to one. Perfect. Plugging in infinity gives us zero. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. So everything is fine. So I didn't have the wrong, the wrong antiderivative. So that is some density, right? But it's unclear how to sample from it, right? But I did already performed already a couple of the steps. I already ca calculated here the cumulative distribution function, the CDF. So the CDF is basically now, um, maybe let's continue over here. So the CDF over there that I need will be the integration from 0 to x of lambda x minus lambda x dx. And here I'm having a different x, so it's this one. So that is the CDF, right? So and then I said that is basically plugging in um, into minus minus lambda x. I need to plug in the 0 and the x. And as I just learned, this one is generating me a 1. Or it get, do I get a minus 1 here? Ah, yeah, I get a minus 1. But it's the second, so it's like the, the plug in the x. That's the first term, right? So that's the minus x minus lambda x minus the minus one, which is like a one. OK, so that's how I get the plus one. OK, nice. Now I need to say y is equal to f of x. And for that one, I can plug in now the, let's say, one minus x of minus lambda x. And now I need to solve for x, right? Which can be done, and I can now do it very fast. Push the e to the other side and the y over there. I have one minus y. Take logarithm, and that is minus lambda, so divided by minus lambda. I think that should be right, but let's check it on the slides, so to save some time here. So here is the derivation, and I think it's the same. Yes, yeah, it is this one. OK, so on the board you have the derivation for the cumulative distribution function. OK, I have the inverse CDF. This is a function now where I can pass through uniformly distributed data. And note that my data is from 0 to 1. Yeah? So it doesn't matter whether I use the formula minus log 1 minus y or whether I use the formula log of y. So that's the same thing. I can change it because my data is uniformly distributed. So it doesn't matter whether I use it backwards or forwards. OK, so we see that now this gives us an algorithm to sample from an exponential distribution. Yeah? I just generate uniformly distributed samples, and I non-linearly transform it with this minus logarithm. OK? Any questions about that one? And now we could give you a PDF, and you need to calculate the CDF, and then you need to calculate the inverse CDF, and then you have your algorithm, and you can generate samples. OK, so far so good. So that is a really nice trick. Um, Let's go to the Gaussian distribution. And the famous method there is the Box-Müller method. And why is it famous? Because I think that is the one that is considered to be the fastest one to generate Gaussian samples. And the way it works is you generate squared magnitudes, OK? And then you generate a random angle. And this gives you a complex number, in a way, right? So it's a complex number, has a distance from the origin, and it has some phase. And now by transforming this complex number back to the Cartesian domain yeah, gives us two numbers. And as it turns out, those two numbers are both Gaussian distributed. But the proof of that one is also against some transformation of variable reasoning. Okay, So basically, you have to show that this transformation of variables turns it into a Gaussian distribution. Yeah? And it's a bit tricky. You can imagine the plugging in some e to the minus lambda x into some formulas, and so on and so forth. For the uniform distribution is always quite nice. It's just constant equal to 1 on a certain interval. can be written as Iverson brackets. And then, basically, you get um, you can prove that both are Gaussian distributed. Okay? 
So there are other methods to sample from a Gaussian, but I think this is the fastest one. And I have a little implementation of that one too, which I show you. So here's the Box Müller one. So I'm sampling from my uniform distribution and passing it through my logarithm and minus a half, uh, one divided by a half. So it's coming from an exponential distribution with parameter 0.5 or two. It depends on how you write it up. Sometimes you write one over lambda for the parameter and sometimes you write lambda, okay? So I don't know what I use over here. But basically now in our old speak, this would be a one half maybe. So maybe that's better like this, okay? So the first thing is sampling us exponentially distributed random variable. Then we sampling angles from zero to two pi. And after that, we just convert using the cosine and the psi sine function, we convert it back into a two by 1000 array. And we can look at the scatter plot and look whether it qualitatively looks like a Gaussian distribution. And as it turns out, I mean, here's two plots. So one plot is coming from our Box Müller sample, yeah, which is that one. And here's one coming from the NumPy implementation. And I guess they are also using Box Müller. I think it's faster to always generate two and then to discard one. If you, have only, if you don't need both, I think it might be even faster to generate two of them. Okay, I just was curious about and checked the square distances from the origin. So I generated some Gaussian, two-dimensional Gaussian distribution and calculated the square distances and made the histogram. And I plotted against the exponential distribution. Okay, so that is the density of the exponential distribution. And as you can see, it's nicely aligned. Yeah? They really match each other very well. So let me put a comment, PDF of exponential. Okay, so far so good. So that was that demo. Any questions to Box Müller? And now we can imagine there's a thick book, it's yellow and it's Springer, yeah, only on random number generation. And there are thousands of these recipes in. You don't see them because you just use some NumPy or some other libraries, and they have implemented all these recipes for efficient number generation. Let's look at some other methods for sampling in the last um, minute that we have. So um, for that one, let's first learn how to graphically sample below a certain density, okay? So I'll show you a picture before I tell you what, how it's done. So suppose you have a density like that, which is plotted with this blue line. Now I want to sample random points that are between the zero axis and this density, okay? So how can you do that? So the way to do it is we sample a location from our P of X, okay? And then we sample uniformly from zero to P of X, okay? So I first sample a value X, and then given that I know that value, I sample from a uniform distribution from zero to that value. And that is giving me the Y coordinate, okay? And that is exactly the implementation. So I'm sampling from a Gaussian here, and then I'm sampling from a uniform, but I multiply it with the height of that Gaussian, with the P of X. And so I'm first sampling a location on the X axis, let's say that one, and then I'm sampling basically among these numbers uniformly. And if I do that, I get this nice scatter plot. And that looks super cool, right? That looks really like a random sample. I could collapse everything down to the axis, but then you wouldn't see it, that it's really a sample. But now by looking at um, the points here, I see that some of the area below is uniformly distributed. Yeah? So that's quite good. So now if I have a function p of x, and I have an algorithm yeah, that allows me to sample from it, I can visually look at it and see whether my sample kind of makes sense. Yeah? However, it also gives us a method to sample from another distribution, which is called rejection sampling. So let's look at rejection sampling. Um, before I describe it, again, let me show you the picture, because the picture is much nicer. So this is my picture. So this is P star of X, the orange one. And it's a complicated distribution, and it's very hard to sample from it. Yeah, because it has a complicated form. However, let's find another distribution, in this case a Gaussian distribution, from which I can sample very easily and make it as large such that the other one disappears below it. Okay? 
And then this one, the larger one, is now some c times q of x. So it's not normalized, of course, anymore. But the p star wasn't normalized either. Yeah? But now I sample from this one by sampling a location from a Gaussian and sampling below it. And then, basically, I'm asking the question, am I also below the other distribution? If yes, it is a sample from my distribution. I keep it. If not, I reject it. And that's why it's called rejection sampling. OK? More mathematically, we would say, um, again, our goal is to sample from an unnormalized density p star. Yeah? So it can be any density, and it doesn't have to sum up to 1 even. So it could be something like this lake, where I don't know the normalization constant. I need to find another density from which I can easily sample. Let's call it q of x. Yeah? And it must, um, I, I must be able to blow it up in such a way that it will majorize the p star. So I need to find a constant c, such that c times the q is greater or equal to the p star. And then I sample below, with the trick from the slide before, below the q of x in two dimensions, as I did before. And if my second dimension is also below the p star of x, then I accept it as a sample. If not, I do it again. So rejection sampling basically Samples, 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 and if I have a sample that is below my p star, I take that as a sample. And all the other ones are rejected. OK? So, um, yeah, here's an example with the mass that is plotted on the next slide. So, this is some unnormalized density, and I don't know how to normalize it. For that one, I would have to take the, expect the expectation of that one, or the, no, the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's getting really hard if I have an x to the 4 in here. So I can easily write down the p star of x, and I can calculate it, but I cannot sample from it. It's really difficult. However, I can sample from a Gaussian distribution, and there's a constant. In this case, it's c equals 17, such that it, this one majorizes the other one. OK? And then I sample from q. I uniformly sample from the interval from 0 to c times q. And then I ask the question, Am I also below my p star? If yes, I got a sample. OK? And this is rejection sampling. Here's an implementation of the mass that we just seen. So here's my p star implementation. I can also show you in the Jupyter notebook. Um, so here's my p star. Fine. Here's the PDF of my q. And I need the PDF of the q function. I need it only to be able to do this uniform sampling step of the y. Otherwise, I wouldn't need it. I can sample just with rand n from a Gaussian distribution. But I need that one, and I also want to plot it. So that's why I define a function for it. Um, then I have this constant factor. So I have a CQ, which is like a blown up Q function. It should be larger than the other one. And next, I can draw samples from it and reject the ones that are below. OK, okay. in this case, I'm not rejecting it. But you can imagine, you, you generate, let's say you want to have 10,000 samples. Yeah, you generate 20,000, and then you reject all of those that are not below. If you don't have 10,000, you sample 1,000 more, and something like that. So that's rejection sampling. OK? And of course, the worse the fit is, the more wasteful it is, and the longer it takes. So you want to minimize the number of rejections, of course. And um, there are a couple of problems, and they have to do with these rejections. In particular, in higher dimensions, it's very hard to have a nice distribution that is easy, that is covering the other one. So here's a toy example. So suppose we have two Gaussian distributions, yeah, p and q, with two different standard deviations, where sigma q is larger than sigma p. So maybe let me draw it on the board. So I forgot which one was larger. So one was larger, and one that is smaller. So the one with the larger variance, of course, is a li little bit lower, right? Also because there's the 1 divided by square root of sigma squared, the normalization constant is 1 divided by the variance. So the one with the larger variance, of course, is smaller. And the one with the, no, the, one with the larger variance yeah, it's a smaller PDF, and the one with a smaller variance has a larger PDF. And, um, but now, of course, you could imagine that 
You could blow up this one, and let me give it the right name that, so that it matches the slide. OK, so sigma q was larger than sigma p. So that basically means that this is p and this is q. And now you could imagine that I can blow up the q by just scaling, right? So, and that one is c times q. OK, I can just blow it up. I can make it larger and larger and larger. And since it's, it's wider anyway, everything will go up, and the other density will be completely below it. And now, again, I can throw darts to so basically uniformly sampling below the curve. Yeah? And then I'm only accepting the stuff that is also below the p. And that is rejection sampling. And now this is in one dimension. And we can now discuss what's happening in higher dimensions. Okay? And for that one, um, we can calculate the optimal constant yeah, in higher dimensions. So first of all, notice the constant must ensure that q of x is greater or equal than p of x. And in our case, the c can be calculated just by calculating p of 0 and q of 0. Right? So those are the heights where I'm cutting the y-axis. And I can plug it in. Yeah? All the non-interesting stuff disappears because e to the minus 0 squared yeah, is just 1. So I'm just remaining with the constants, but they the p1 goes down and the q1 is up here. And I get rid of the other constants here. I just cancel each other out. And I get an expression like sigma q divided by sigma p to the power of d. So let's say our ratio at the beginning is constant. Okay, The distance between the two variances is constant. I can rewrite this also as e, e of d times logarithm of the ratio. And there you see that it's exponentially growing in d. So if I increase the dimensionality of the problem, not a one-dimensional Gaussian, but a two-dimensional, or a three, or four, or five, or six, or ten-dimensional Gaussian, the c will exponentially increase. So it's growing very, very, very fast. So curiously, the c describes the volume under my blown-up function, c times q of x, because q of x was, has an area of 1, and then c times q of x has an area of c. So 1 divided by c is the proportion, basically, of the stuff that I have to throw away. So my ex acceptance ratio will be 1 divided by c. So you see that in larger and larger dimensions, my acceptance ratio will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So basically, rejection sampling takes a very, 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 very long time until we hit something inside. So the margin, so this area outside of the center is exponentially growing. That's also the reason why an, an orange in 10 dimension is a bad deal, because there's not much fruit inside. Most of the stuff is outside, this thing that you that want to peel away. Yeah? So a 10-dimensional orange is no fun. OK, so that's why rejection sampling is not such a great idea in many dimensions. Let's look at another method, important sampling. Yet another variation. Again, the goal is um, we want to calculate the expectation of some function in this case. Okay? So it's not sampling per se, but it's, let's say, typically we want to calculate an integration or some expected value of some phi of x. And maybe we can compute our p of x, so we can compute the value of the density. Yeah, that was necessary also for the rejection sampling method to make a comparison. But we cannot sample from it easily. Yeah, again, uh, an example is, so here is some density, uh, and m let's hope it's normalized. It's easy to compute, but it's difficult to sample from. And let's say we are in such a situation. We could reweight our solution. Yeah? So the idea is the following. Let's generate samples from another density, and then let's take these samples from Q of F and give them different weights. Yeah? So basically, if the Q gives is very large, q of x is very large for a certain value, but the p of x might be very small, then we need to downweight this sum end and the other way around. So we basically can derive a formula as follows. So actually, we're interested in this integral here, in this expectation. We extend it just by the quotient q divided by q, which is 1. 
And now we got a new integral where we say, okay, we can also take samples of q of x, okay, and that will be also an approximation of the whole thing. However, the function changed now. The function is now phi of x times this quotient, okay? And so basically, this p of x divided by q of x is reweighting the samples that we get from q of x. Yeah, the ones from q that are very likely need to be downweighted, and the ones that are very likely for p of x but not for q of x must be upweighted to get the right summation over here. Okay? So we can also um, give names for that one. So we could call these things weights w for xi, so which is basically this quotient. And then we have a weighted sum of the original one. But now we have samples from q and we have these weights which ensure that we are calculating the right thing. Okay? So that is basic important sampling. Um, now what one can show is, in the limit, yeah, for n against infinity, so if I have more and more samples, one can show that also such a reweighted solution will converge against the right one. Okay, so that's possible to show. If I'm sampling from Q and have the right reweighting, everything is fine. Um, we can, in this equation, we can also plug in a special case, phi of x being equal to 1, and I just wrote it out because we need that expression as well in a second for something more complicated. Of course, it also works for a constant function 1, where it says that the average of these weights basically converges against 1, okay? So that's something else that is useful. Um, let's now look at a more, slightly more complicated problem. We don't have p of x, but again, we have some unnormalized density, and as I said, in practical things like Markov random fields or some other areas, it happens very often that we only have a, a p star and we don't have a p, okay? And in that case, we can also do importance weighting, but it's not obvious anymore. We can't just use this trick here because we would only have a p star in here, and so there's something missing. So there's some, the reweighting wouldn't work if the p of x doesn't integrate to 1. So for that reason, um, we need another trick. So, oh, and we even look at a more general problem. So suppose we have samples from an unnormalized density. So the Q is unnormalized and the P star is also unnormalized. So this is now in two ways more general than the previous one. So the samples are coming from an unnormalized Q, so I don't have access to Q of X, so I can't plug it in to calculate weights, and I don't have access to P of X, but only to P star of X. So the solution is as follows. The first note is, let's just define the ratios using the unnormalized PDFs. And for that one now, we have these additional constants Zp and Zq over here. And they are making things wrong, okay? So that is the problem. However, um, we can do the following. We can normalize our weights. So let's say the Wxi, um, they can be normalized by themselves, yeah? And one can show that that is the same as doing the same thing with the W stars. Why is that the same? Because in the nominator, I'm having the Zp divided by Zq, and in the denominator, I'm also having Zp divided by Zq, so it cancels out. Okay, so the first insight is, so the, the nice weights that I want to use, yeah? I could normalize them as well and get the same expression if I would normalize the W stars. Okay, so far so good. So let's use these normalized weights and plug them into our formula. So we average now with these normalized weights, and we know that we could replace these W stars in that expression also just with Ws. So far so good. Then we get a quotient of two expressions that both converge to something, and for the top part, we know already it will converge against the correct number. And for the bottom part, we've seen on a couple of slides ago, it converges against 1. OK, so that was the story about the second expression. So there's basic importance weighting, uh, importance sampling, which basically takes this ratio over here. And then there's the self-normalizing importance sampling, which is using a slightly different version of that one. So the W stars are the quotient of non-normalized P star and Q star, but if we normalize those by themselves, everything will be fine. 
Okay? And so that's even more fancy and more general to apply. Again, I have some code. And let me show you maybe in the notebook. So here's an implementation of the basic important sampling. Oh, no, there's only the mass, and there's no implementation. I only have the implementation for the self-normalized one. And as you can see, here I'm distinguishing between P star and Q and Q star, OK? And I can plot all those functions. And one can then show that by um, defining the P star to be, uh, the W star to be the quotient of P stars and Q stars, I get the right estimate if I divide the W stars by the sum of all of them. Yeah, but you have to do that one. Otherwise, you're doing a systematic mistake which you want to avoid. OK, so far so good. We are almost at the end. Of course, there are also problems here. So with important sampling, the problem is as follows. Um, sometimes there might be regions where my Q of x is very, very small, but the one I'm interested in is very, very large, which means I rarely see these Q of x. Okay. So I rarely see actually quite important numbers. If I see them, yeah, dividing by the Q of x gives a really large weight. And that then generates a very large variance. So the problem is that we derived at the beginning that the variance of an MC estimator is just the variance of this function that we are trying to evaluate. However, now this function changes with this quotient. And so sometimes I might be very unlucky and generate here really large values. So the variance of important sampling is much larger than if I could directly sample from the P of x. So there's nothing for free here. OK, that's it for today. Um, let's stop here. So next time we look at MCMC methods, which are yet other methods to sample some sequences of random numbers. Thanks for your attention, and I see you on next Monday.